First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this conference and uh, inviting me to speak here. It's my first time in Korea and I, I've been really enjoying being here. Food is excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a, a project with Dan Morgalit and Oik Jurtas with uh, about fast news and thirst and classification. So, um, so it's about an algorithm, a fast algorithm that does news and thirst and classification and computes other things. So let me start with reviewing the, the Nielsen and thirst and classification for mapping class groups. So I denote the mapping class group by mod s. So this is the uh, group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of uh, some finite type surface up to isotopy. Um, and the Nielsen Thurston classification uh, tells us that every element of the mapping class group is a uh, is one of three types. So the first type is finite order. So here an example would be for instance this surface and uh, rotating the surface by one click. The second type is pseudo and also So here we have um, we have two transverse invariant foliations, and uh, in one direction uh, the surface is stretched by a factor of lambda, and in another direction it's uh, shrinked by a factor of one over lambda, and this this surface might this these foliations might have uh, singularities like this. So it's, uh, these are singular measured foliations. So the foliation that is stretched, we call it the, uh, the unstable foliation. And the foliation that's compressed, it's called the, the, the stable foliation. And we have a third type. Um, maybe I put this here. Um, the third type is reducible. Uh, reducible mapping classes, it's sort of a combination of these two. So we have a bunch of curves that are invariant as a set. So they may be permuted. Okay, so these, uh, these curves are invariant, they might be permuted. So these are called reducing curves. Um, and <clears throat> the components might, may also be permuted as long as the topological type is the, is the same. So maybe, maybe these two are permuted um, and maybe these two are fixed. So we have per permutation of components, and on each com component we either have a pseudo and also or, or a finite order action. So maybe maybe we have a pseudo and also on these components and finite orders. In these components. Um, so there's also, um, it's also possible that the boundary components are permuted even if, even if a component is fixed. Um, and there's also some twisting that might happen along the boundary components. 
So also there is some possibly some twisting data along the boundary components. All right. So uh, so if if one has all this data, all the components, all the reducing curves, all permutations, all the gluing data, all the twisting. So all these all these pieces together. Um, gives a complete conjugacy invariant of the mapping class. So one motivation to to compute compute lots of these all these things about about a mapping class is if you can compute all of them efficiently and put them together. We, you can compute a com complete conjugacy invariant efficiently and solve the conjugacy problem quickly. Um, so let me let me state our uh, our main theorem. So what we want to do is we want to compute all of these things efficiently. We're not quite there yet, but we can do many things already. So there is a quadratic time algorithm. Uh, that computes um, that computes the uh, well the stretch factor invariant foliations and and invariant these so all this data in on all components, like all reducible components, um, the reducing curves um, and uh, and also the order of the mapping class in the finite order case. Uh, so let me um, let me tell you what what we mean by an algorithm, what is the input, and how we measure the running time. So the input, uh, so, so it's an element of the mapping class group uh, as, as a word in some fixed finite generating set, in some finite generating set. And the running time is measured um, in terms of the length of the word. Okay. Running time it's a function of the length. So when I say quadratic time, it means that it's quadratic time in, in the length, length of the word. All right, so uh, so this is the mapping class group picture. But let me uh, let me let me give you two other uh, areas where motivations come from. One of them is three manifolds. The other one is translation surfaces. Um, so for three manifolds, Um, if you have a mapping class, we can construct the mapping torus, which gives us a three manifold. Right? So cross, we cross a surface with an interval and glue the two boundary components together with the, with the map. And this is the mapping torus MF. So one thing that's, that's really useful uh, if you have a mapping class is being able to compute this mapping torus. So, um, Given f, computing, uh, computing the mapping torus, and there is already there is already a program that does it. It's called Twister by uh, Mark Bell, um, Tracy Hall, 
and uh, Saul Schleimer. So once we have a mapping torus, uh, well, in the pseudonus of Ks, F is pseudonus, so if and only if the mapping torus is, is hyperbolic. So if we start from pseudonosov map, it would be also really useful to compute the hyperbolic structure here. Um, uh, and there's already also uh, a program for that. Snap P can, can do this um, from the output of this twister. Uh, the, the kernel was written originally by Jeff Weeks and it's currently maintained by Nathan Dunfield and Mark Culler. Um, but there's some other there's some other things to compute about three manifolds that SnapP currently cannot do. So uh, these things would be the Thurston norm fiber faces. Uh, Peck Miller polynomial So these objects are really useful for understanding different vibrations of a manifold over the circle. Yes? What is the output of the program that computes the map mapping for its work? So this is like a huge triangulation. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Right, so, um, so these are, these, these are useful to understand different vibrations of a 3 manifold over the circle. The Tech-Müller polynomial can be used to compute the stretch factors of, of the different vibrations. Um, so Tech-Müller polynomial was introduced by Macmillan. Um, and he also explained that this can be computed from an invariant train track. So some, some, something else that would be useful here is... Uh, is uh, in the in the pseudonosov case is an invariant chain check. And assuming this, Macmillan tells us that the Tech Miller polynomial can be computed. And he also explains that the Tech Miller polynomial can be used to compute the Feidberg phase uh, and the Thurston norm. Um, so these, these are currently not implemented anywhere, as far as I know. Um, and the one last thing about the three manifolds is uh, Eagle's Viering triangulation. Um, this is this is also related to invariant train checks, and this is uh, this is implemented in Flipper by by Mark Bell. Um, so here, you know, for the three manifold pictures, many many computations are are already done, uh, but for the other topic, translation surfaces. Um, there are really important pieces missing. So, right. So, so if you have a pseudonosov, uh, pseudonosov element, then the the two foliations, the stable and the unstable foliations together, uh, give uh, give a translation surface. And um, there are lots of programs already for computing things about translation surfaces. In fact, there is a Sage, Sage package uh, in progress. It's in progress by Vincent Delacroix and Pat Hooper. Um, and another example would be uh, Ronan Mukamal has a program that computes uh, VG groups of certain translation surfaces. So, uh, 
uh, VH groups. Um, but the issue here is that there is, uh, there is absolutely no, uh, at this point, connection between the mapping class group picture, like computing things about the mapping class groups that would output a translation surface for a pseudo -nosov. So this, this arrow is, is currently com completely missing. So what we also try to do is not only compute these things efficiently, but also being able to construct this translation surface efficiently to, to bridge this gap here. All right. Any, any questions at this point? So what, what do you mean by the computing translation surface? So, so that, that two foliation gives us some kind of flat structure on the surface, right? Yeah. So, uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so it, it has to do with how, what I mean by computing the invariant foliations. Yeah. So um, the easiest way to represent uh, an invariant foliation is by some coordinates in the measured lamination space. Mm -hmm. So computing Fu and Fs, we have two vectors uh, of, like, we have just two vectors that represent them. So how do we get a triangulated surface, like a tra translation surface from that? It's not, not quite clear. We need to do something to translate those coordinates into an actual triangulation of the surface. All right, so, so um, to, to, exp to explain the idea of, uh, um, of our algorithm and many, many algorithms that came before us, uh, let me give you an analogy between the hyperbolic plane and, uh, and mapping class groups. So, um, so we have the hyperbolic plane with its uh, ideal boundary and we can look at isometries of the hyperbolic plane, and these are classified into three types, right? Um, we, have, uh, we have elliptic isometries and parabolic and hyperbolic isometries. And they are distinguished by the by by the action on the boundary. Uh, so let's let's just assume for now that we talk about finite order elliptic elements. So in this case, the action on the on the boundary of an elliptic element up to taking powers is the identity, right? Some power fixes the ident the boundary completely. Now for parabolic ones. Uh, we have exactly one fixed point, and we have a sort of a sourcing dynamics in the neighborhood of the point. And for hyperbolic ones, we have two fixed points. Um, and we have this real sourcing dynamics. Now for the mapping class group, we also have a space, the technical space, and uh, the space of piecewise uh, projective measure laminations. Um, so technical space for closed surfaces, it's homomorphic to R to 6G minus 6, and this is sphere uh, with one dimension less, so they fit together to a closed ball. And the mapping class group acts by isometries, um, and we have a similar picture for the action on the boundary. So there are the three types in the nielsen thurston classification. So the finite order case exactly looks like that. Some, some power of the element fixes the whole boundary. Uh, now for, for the pseudo one of case, it's again exactly the same picture. We have two fixed points. One of them is the unstable foliation. The other one is the stable foliation. Um, and the reducible case is, 
is, is a bit complicated because, uh, because in higher dimensions we might have many fixed points. So it's not just one fixed point. Um, and the dynamics, dynamics, the action on the boundary also looks more complicated. But it's always true that uh, up to some finite power, the, these reducing curves uh, are going to be realized as fixed points on the boundary. So the reducing curves uh, we will see as fixed points. Um, so now, if, if the fixed set here can indeed be more complicated, more than just one point, then, uh, then one may wonder how do we efficiently distinguish these two cases. Um, and it turns out that this, uh, this space of piece, uh, projective measured laminations has some extra structure that, uh, that helps distinguish these two cases. So the projective measured lamination space is a quotient of the measured lamination space. Uh, so this is again homomorphic to R2 6G minus 6. Uh, and this has a natural piecewise linear structure. So this has a PL structure. Um, and and then mapping class group acts acts by act, act, it acts by piecewise linear maps. Um, so projectively, uh, fixed points are just eigenvectors of a linear map, right? So, um, so these fixed points on the boundary are really eigenvectors in ML. So each, every fixed point has some associated eigenvalue to it. And it turns out that in, in the pseudonus of case, the associated eigenvalue to FU is, uh, is exactly the stretch vector. Here it's, well, it's 1 over the stretch vector. And for reducing curves, the eigenvalue is, is 1. Okay, so, so, the, so this picture, um, broadly speaking, gives an algorithm for finding the Nielsen Thurston type. Um, if one can compute the whole action, this whole piecewise linear action on the boundary, then one can first check if some power, some small power is, is the identity. In this case, it's finite order. If, if not, then we calculate all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If you find an eigenvalue, which is one, then that means we found the reducing, reducing curve. So we are in the reducible case. And if you don't find any eigenvalues with lambda equals one, then we know we are in the pseudonus of case. And in this case, we just need to find the two fixed points with uh, the two eigenvectors with lambda and one over lambda. And, and the eigen, those eigenvectors will be the stable and unstable foliations. So can, can you ask you one thing? Uh, so in a reducible case, so if, you, if it is composed of two partial pseudonus of mass, then uh, the union of two stable lamination or mm -hmm. two unstable lamination are mm -hmm. also fixed points. That's right. So in that case, the eigenvalue might, might not be one. That's right. That's right. So th th there can be m other eigenvalues here other than one. Mm -hmm. But um, but you yeah, but you, but you you must have a, if you compute everything you have to have to find one that's one. Yeah, so next uh, I, I want to make this, uh, yes, I want to make this uh, measured lamination space a bit explicit and e explain, explain roughly how this computation would go and how you would get the matrices. Yeah, so, so, here, is, uh, so here, is, here is the way to define this measured lamination space, like one way to define it. Define the piecewise linear structure. Um, so, um, so here is how you define a cell decomposition. Uh, 
of, uh, of the measured lamination space. So, so first, pick a marking. Uh, first, pick a marking of the surface. This can be, for instance, you can represent the surface as a polygon uh, with sides identified somehow. It could be an ideal polygon uh, that gives a marking of a surface. Or you can, you can have a puncture disk uh, marked by these, these arcs. This is also, well, the surface becomes the union of like two polygons. This is also marking. You can also take a triangulation of the surface that's also marking. Or in general, well, all these cases work only for the punctured, for punctured surfaces. But for closed surfaces, one can also take uh, pent decompositions. Um, well, and marked curves. So, a pens decompositions and marking each each curve in a pens decomposition by by another curve intersecting it. So this gives a marking for all surfaces, even non-orientable ones and closed surfaces. So, so once you have a marking, uh, define a standard standard position for curves, for curves and laminations. So uh, how do we do that in, in this case? Well, any curve uh, on the surface consists of arcs that connect two, two boundary components. So maybe they are really squiggly, but then you can isotope it so that all the arcs connect almost the midpoints of two edges with almost, uh, like, almost, so very nice uh, arcs. Okay, so we get something like uh, something like this. This would be a standard position. Here also, any arc that we get, we can isotope so that all arcs look, look like half circles. Um, and there is a way to do it in, in Pan's decomposition case as well. Okay, once, once one does this, then uh, one can define standard train tracks. Um, so just by collapsing uh, these bundle of arcs into to one to one edge. Okay, there are clearly finitely many things I can get because there are finitely many arcs uh, in all cases. So I get a finite collection of of these standard train tracks, and these standard train tracks correspond to my cells uh, in, in the cell decomposition. OK, so now I have a cell decomposition of the measured lamination space, with charts being these standard train tracks. And if I have, if I have a mapping class, maybe a Dane twist, that I apply to this standard train track, well, it changes the train track in a way that it doesn't look standard anymore. Um, and it will have it will probably have bygones, bygones with these arcs that are not possible to remove by isotopy. So in this case, one would, one would peel off these arcs uh, and split the train track to many different train tracks uh, that look like standard train tracks. Um, so this would correspond to like, mapping this chart onto uh, in ML. And if it's not linear, we just subdivide this cell into little pieces so that all the little pieces map linearly to all the other charts. And one can, so if I, if I have a fixed generating set, maybe a set of the twists, I can explicitly compute how to split these train tracks and explicitly compute the matrices between the different coordinate charts. And this is my description of, the, of this piecewise linear action. Any questions about this?
Okay, so right. So um, so I mentioned that 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 this this description gives an algorithm. So the input is 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 a word uh, word in in this generating set, and what we do is we compute the whole action, um, and the whole action will be some piecewise linear action. Um, with uh, many, many, many different pieces. And we compute the eigenvectors in each, uh, in each region. Um, and we can determine the nielsen thurston type. Now, the issue is that there can be exponentially many pieces in the word length. Because as you apply one more generator and one more generator, and you subdivide the cells more and more, uh, we can get exponentially many. many uh, pieces. Uh, so, so the running time of this naive algorithm would be, would be exponential. All right, so let me mention some other algorithms. Um, as far as I know, this algorithm has never actually been implemented. So the... Um, So the, the first algorithm was, that was implemented, at, at least it has at least two different implementations, is the best winner handle uh, is the best winner handle algorithm, which uh, finds the reducing curves and the stretch factor, uh, and also an invariant train check. Um, so. It's implemented as the program trains by Toby Hall and X train by Peter Brinkman. Um, in, in practice, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not very fast. It's uh, probably the, the running time is, is also, also exponential. Um, and there are some, some newer algorithms, like list, list and check algorithms that are also exponential time. Cobert de uh, um, and, and more recently, uh, Mark Bell showed that the, the, the problem of Nielsen Thurston classification is, is in NP uh, and co NP. So from this follows that there is an exponential time algorithm. Okay, so, so these algorithms, um, they show that they are not, not fast, they are exponential time. So in searching for faster algorithms, people started to use iterative algorithms. So just like um, they are very similar to these iterative algorithms for finding eigenvectors. You just take an eigenvector and start iterating the matrix and it converges to the dominant eigenvector, if there is one. So it's a similar idea. We have this sourcing dynamics here. So we take any curve, we start iterating. In the pseudonus of case, it, it should converge here. So we should be able to approximate the the the, um, the unstable foliation. So, iterative methods uh, by, uh, there are again at least two implementations, DIN, the program DIN by Toby Hall. This, uh, this works in the Dinikov coordinates uh, on puncture disks and Flipper. Uh, by Mark Bell. This works for uh, uh, any punctured surface. This works by uh, on triangulated surfaces. Um, and so the advantage of these algorithms that uh, in practice they are really fast. Um, they are really fast in practice. Um, the issues is, is one issue is that they suffer from um, 
this pro problem of iterative algorithms that there is no natural stopping condition. Right? If, if, you have, if you are in the reducible case, for instance, we don't know if, if we ever get convergence, we don't know um, how fast we converge. Even in the pseudo case, it's not, far, not, not clear how fast the convergence is. Right, um, and it turns out that the convergence to, to the unstable foliation can actually be exponentially slow. Uh, so this was shown by Bell and Schleimer. Convergence even in Sudanosov case can be exponentially slow. So what does it mean? So it means that, let's say you want to approximate this unstable foliation. So this is a vector um, in, in these coordinates. You want to approximate it so that each coordinate is approximated by like 10-digit uh, precision. So this is saying that in order to gain one-digit precision, you need to apply your mapping class exponentially many times in terms of the word length. So if you, if you, if you need to estimate uh, your vector 10 digit, 10 digit precision, you need exponentially many iterations. They constructed example. They also, sh well, experimentally, uh, they showed that this is not typical. So typically the convergence is fast, but there are some, some rare cases when the convergence is very slow. So that's when the second eigenvalue is close to the property. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and um, other than our algorithm, there is, there is also uh, another polynomial algorithm now, which was obtained by Bell and uh, Mark Bell and Richard Webb, um, well, independently and using uh, completely different methods. They use the curve complex, the action of the mapping class group in the curve complex. So this is another polynomial time. Uh, algorithm, um, and this this finds the uh, this finds the reducing curves, and uh, so it finds the Nielsen Thurston type reducing curves and uh, and the translation length in the curve complex. So their, their paper is already on the archive. Is this also polynomial time in terms of word length? Yeah, same, in terms of the same, same things, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so let me mention the, the idea behind our algorithm. Um, so the idea is sort of combining, combining this algorithm, which is exponentially slow, with the iterative algorithm that is fast in practice. Um, so, so the idea is that, uh, so in the Sudanosov case, um, So let's say that this is uh, this is the space in this is this is PML, and we have the unstable foliation here. And and these are the pieces of the piecewise linear action. Um, and we know there can be exponentially many pieces. So we don't want to compute the action in all the exponentially many pieces, 
But we also know that there is, uh, if, we, if we have a point uh, and start iterating the point, eventually it has to get really close to, to the unstable foliation. So it makes sense to just, to just first iterate the point a couple of times until it gets sufficiently close to, uh, well, it gets into one of these regions adjacent to the unstable foliation. And once we get there, then just compute the action on just that one chart, um, and then compute the eigenvalues of this matrix that we get here. Um, so the question is, how quickly do we get into one of these good regions? That's the big question. Um, and we also need to understand the situation in the reducible case. Um, maybe I don't draw the picture because it's more difficult. The fixed set is more difficult, and the sourcing dynamics is more difficult. But also, um, there's a similar situation that there's a bunch of uh, neighborhoods of some sort of attracting, attracting set. And we, what we want is iterate the point uh, some number of times so that we get into these good regions. And then we compute eigenvectors there. And, and the idea is that we should be able to see all the reducing curves and all the invariant foliations on all the pieces. So what makes this, this, this whole thing work is that it turns out that the number of iterations necessary to get into the, to these attracting regions is, uh, is constant. It's constant in the word length. Um, so, so this is our, this is our theorem that, that makes, uh, makes everything work. So if we fix the cell decomposition, um, T of, uh, of the measured lamination space and some starting curve, uh, some starting curve at the measured lamination space, then, um, then there exists Q, depending only, only on this chosen cell decomposition and the curve, and not depending on the word, such that such that f to the q c is uh, is in the linear linear basin. So these, these are the linear basins. Can we turn on the projector now? So in the rest of the, in the remaining time, um, I want to show some pictures from the proof, uh, proof of this, uh, this statement. Um, we, we get the train track too. Um, this theorem doesn't explain why we get the train track, but we get the train track too. And that's also in quadratic time? Uh, that's also in quadratic time. So we expect that everything, everything, in quadra everything in, is in quadratic time that, um, that I mentioned in the beginning. So the whole conjugacy problem should be con uh, quadratic time, the translation surface should also be quadratic time. Um, one, one other thing, one, one thing that, um, that's different for these different computations is the dependence on, on the genus, dependence on the surface. So just for this basic data, the stretch factor and foliations and, and even, I think, even the tr translation surface, the, the dependence on the genus is, is very good. It's uh, just quadratic just quadratic in the Euler characteristics. So it scales very well with uh, taking more complicated surfaces. But for instance, the conjugacy problem, for the conjugacy problem, it's, it's definitely not possible to do it better than exponential time in terms of the size of the surface because of, because of 
keeping track of all the gluing data of the subsurfaces. Uh, okay, so 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 the main uh, one of the main tools in the arguments are train tracks. Um, I can just use it in the meantime. Okay, so so maybe I don't explain it because I'm running out of time. But the the, the idea is that the the linear basin, so these regions correspond to these charts correspond to train tracks that are invariant under the map. So train tracks map onto themselves nicely. That are also uh, also carried on one one of like the carried on some, some tau i of the cell decomposition. So they have to be invariant uh, and have to be compatible with the train checks of the cell decomposition. So the way to get, uh, the way to get um, train checks that are carried on a train check is by doing splittings of a train check. So um, if you have a train check that lo locally looks like, like this, uh, we can do uh, either of these two operations, these two splits. Uh, and in the level of PML or PMF, what we see is that we have a chart corresponding to that train track, and we get we, we subdivide the chart and keep one of the parts. Okay, so, so the key, key notion uh, that we use is the notion of slope. Okay, so let's say we have a train track. We can, uh, we can draw the dual triangulation of the chain track, putting a vertex in each complementary region and taking uh, the dual triangulation. If it's a trivalent chain track, then we get the triangulation. And then, um, so what happens with uh, the dual triangulation when we do a split? Um, uh, we just flip an edge. Okay, so we, next we define straight dual triangulations. So now my train check is, uh, is carrying the unstable lamination. Um, and so I draw the dual triangulation, and this dual triangulation will be dual to the, to the unstable foliation. Um, and and the, vertices, the vertices of the triangulation are at the singularities of the, of the foliation. So now what, what I can do is now consider this translation surface, this flat surface consider a uh, flat surface built from the unstable and stable foliations and pull it tight. Uh, like move, move, these, move these vertices to the corresponding singularities and pull it tight in the flat surface. So we get, uh, maybe we get something, something nice where the edges are saddle connections or maybe, maybe we have like a more, more complicated, more degenerate triangulation. 
All right. So, um, so each each triangle here will have exactly one horizontal separatrix going into the triangle. So we um, and that horizontal separatrix will be opposite to uh, to this to this cusp of the train track. So we call this we call these angles uh, at, at each triangle that contains the horizontal separatrix cusp angles. And there are two types of cusp angles. There are ones that contain, contain, contain vertical separatrices and ones that don't. So here there is no vertical separatrix. So this here we call it acute. And this has a vertical separatrix, so we call this obtuse. Um, now, the one observation is, is that if all, the, if all these cusp angles are acute, then we have a really, really nice triangulation, really nice train track. So um, the goal is to get rid of the obtuse angles. And the lemma is that if all cusp angles are acute, then the, this triangulation of this section, is a, this, this is a section of the V-ring triangulation, if you know what this is. Uh, but the point is that if we, have, if we have that, then after a few more splits, we get an invariant train check. OK, so basically the goal is to get rid of the obtuse angles by splittings. And, and that gives us the invariant train check that we want. Okay, so, so what is slope? So, uh, so slope is just what you think it is. So if, uh, if we have a curve arc, uh, let's, say, let's say we have a curve or arc in the surface, then we pull it tight in this flat structure, and it, it might consist of many different saddle connections. Um, so we just take the slopes of all those saddle connections and, and represent it as, like, as an interval. Um, and there's, there's a bound on the length of the intervals. So, so if you have two disjoint saddle connections, they can be really, really, uh, the slopes can, can be really far away from each other. So, so in a way, it, this defines a nice uh, slope for all curves and arcs and triangulations. And we can also define um, the slope of a train track by considering the slope of its dual triangulation. Okay, so, so the first lemma is that if we have a curve whose slope is, meaning that the interval of slopes is completely uh, less, smaller, than the slope of the train track, then C has to be carried on uh, the train track or its dual triangulation, or its dual extension. And um, it's, it's pretty easy to see this by a picture. So, if, if this curve has a small slope, that means that, that the arcs can intersect uh, this, this tall edge with one of the two opposite edges, but this cannot happen. So if we have an arc connecting these two edges, we can homotope it into this branch of the train track. These ones we can homotope here. And these ones that hit the singularity, that contribute to the diagonal extension of the train track. Um, the second fact is, um, is that as long as we have an obtuse cusp angle, then, um, then, then the slope, slope of the train track cannot decrease under splittings. Uh, actually, sometimes it, it increases. So let's say we have this obtuse cusp angle here, and we do a split. If you do a split, then this edge flips. So what we see is that this, 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 this obtuse cusp angle becomes, becomes smaller. Um, which means that the slope of this diagonal becomes, becomes bigger. Okay, so there's no, there's no way the, the slopes can decrease under splitting as long as we have obtuse angles. And the third fact is that uh, it's, it's, it's an obvious fact that if, if, I, if I apply my Sudanosov, which stretches horizontally by lambda and, and compresses vertically by one over lambda, then the slope decreases by a factor of lambda squared. Okay, so now let's put all these facts together. So here's the picture. 
uh, this is one of this is my standard chain check carrying the the unstable lamination. So I have the corresponding chart in PMF, and, and here is the unstable foliation in, inside it. Here is the dual triangulation of the chain check. And here it's represented what the slope of the chain check is and, and what the slope of the curve is. So now I, I start to do splittings to remove the obtuse angles. So I see an obtuse angle here. Uh, I do a split. OK, now what happens? I know that the, the slope, uh, slope of the chain check can increase, so it, it increases a bit now. Um, and, and I subdivide my chart and keep half of it. Okay, now once again I see an obtuse angle and I flip. Um, in this case the slope, slopes actually stay the same, but definitely the slope of the chain check doesn't decrease. Again I subdivide my triangle. And then one more obtuse slope. Uh, I flip, uh, my chart becomes even smaller. And now there are no more obtuse angles, which means I basically have my invariant chain check, which means that I got to my linear basin. Okay, and I got to the linear basin without this, these slopes uh, ever decreasing, the chain, chain check of the slope ever decreasing. So what I can do is apply, uh, apply some power of of my mapping class to C, and I know that applying F decreases the slope of the curve. So I can apply some power of F that shifts this interval to the left of this, and when it happens, I know that the curve has to be carried on the chain track, which geometrically here, it means that I apply the power, uh, Qth power, and this point gets into, into the region. And this is exactly what I want. I want a constant power a small power Q that gets me into this linear region. All right, so the question is uh, how big is Q? And how big is Q depends, well, we know, we know how much applying F translates. So all we need to know is how long the intervals are to know, to know how, how big Q we need to take. Um, and how long the intervals are depends on how much the slope difference can be between two disjoint saddle connections in the surface. And we have a lemma that, that gives an estimate for that uh, in terms of the stretch factor um, and uh, the genus and, and the punctures. So since, since, uh, since F translates by lambda squared, right, then we need to take Q to be approximately this, this power here. Uh, to shift the interval completely to the left of tau. So this is the Q that we need to take, um, and that's, uh, that's quadratic in the, in the Euler characteristic. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>